In this episode, you're going to learn how you can design sustainable solutions with very limited resources that make a deep impact on people's lives. Here are the guests for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Pierre. Hi, this is Gonzalo Rodino, and this is the Service Design Show, episode 112. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about empowering you with the most effective skills and strategies so you can design services that win the hearts of people and business. And this is going to be a really special episode because the guests in this episode are Gonzalo Rodion and Firek Mack. Now, I can imagine that you haven't heard about Gonzalo and Firek. That's because they work in a non-profit organization called IDE Innovation Lab in Cambodia. And when I heard about their story, I got really excited because they are using human-centered design around wicked problems that involve better child nutrition, uh, giving access to clean water and helping rural farmers make a better living. And the amazing thing is they do all this while juggling with the needs of funders, dealing with very uh, complex relationships uh, uh, with stakeholders and with very limited resources. And still they are able to come up with solutions that make a deep impact on people's lives. How do they do that? Now, if this sounds like a very distant world from your reality, I would say adopt an open mindset and let this episode surprise you. As you'll discover throughout the episode, our worlds aren't all that different. And in fact, I think there's a lot you can learn from the work Gonzalo and Firek are doing. If you're new to the Service Design Show, welcome and consider subscribing to the channel because we bring a new video that helps to level up your service design skills at least once a week. So click that subscribe button and that bell icon so you'll be notified when new videos are out. Now, having said that, it's time to sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation with Gonzalo and Firek. Welcome to the show, Firek and uh, Gonzalo. Hey, Mark, how's it going? Hi. Uh, it's going really good. On this uh, Monday, we're, uh, Monday morning for me, we're recording this on a, on a Monday. Uh, this is going to be... Um, Sort of a first because uh, I've done uh, duo interviews before, but not in this new format. So we'll have to see how this goes. I'm really excited yeah. because the topic of today is uh, it's quite cool. Um, Gonzalo and Pierre, could you give a short introduction about who you are? Uh, and then we'll move on into what you actually do. Because again, that's, that's really exciting. Uh, Gonzalo, maybe you want to start? Sure, yes. So I, I'm Gonzalo Rodino. I am Argentinian, uh, Australian. Uh, designer and I'm working as a design researcher at the IDE Innovation Lab in currently rainy Cambodia and I've been here for mm. about two and a half years or so. How about you, Hi. Pierre? Yeah. I'm Pierre. Um, I've been working for 10 years and the last six years I focus on social innovations. Um, I was working for IDE um, and we focus on design, research, and strategies. And now I moved to Australia for my master degree. Now, all I'm right, Brisbane. yeah. <laughs> so we are we're having uh, the Netherlands, Cambodia, and Australia in this episode. Yeah, Pretty awesome. Four, three um, time zones. Yeah, three time zones. We're going to talk about a topic that people might not uh, initially uh, associate with service design or the things we address a lot here on the show it's going to be around social innovation but especially in uh, in an area which is quite different than the corporate environment and i think there's so much we can learn uh, from that uh, you already touched upon an organization called ide uh, could could you give a a little bit of background story what is that yeah, I can start. So IDE is an international NGO. It's founded in 1982 in the U.S. by Paul Polak, and then it entered in Cambodia in 1994. Um, actually, it's, its projects generally cover sanitation, water, uh, hygiene, and agriculture. Um, and Gonzalo and I actually working for a unit of, let, let's, let's call it an in-house innovation lab, uh, it's in IDE, 
um, so we're both working for this unit. Okay. Uh, so it's a lot about uh, social innovation. Yeah, I'm, I'm using the term social innovation. I'm not sure if you're also using that term, but uh, is that yeah. is that the main area? It's it's probably the the best umbrella to kind of cover all the different topics that we work on. Uh, yeah, social innovation, which includes you know research, design, uh, from service design to sometimes uh, product design, strategy. It's quite broad and. Even more recently, uh, we, uh, because we are an in-house unit, we consult a lot for external organizations. And so we've been working in uh, you know, clean energy, most recently in maternal, young child nutrition. So yeah, really it's quite, um, it's quite broad and we apply the methodology, human-centered design methodology across, yeah. uh, across sectors. Yeah, that's the thing that's going to connect us in this episode. Before we dive into some of your uh, really inspiring projects, uh, I want to learn, get to know you a little bit better, and we're going to do that through our 60-second rapid-fire <laughs> right. Q&A. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask the question, and maybe uh, Gonzalo, if you start, and Pierre, you just answer the same question, then uh, we'll try to do it in 60 seconds. Um, okay. All right. Question number one. Uh, Gonzalo, what's always in your fridge? Uh, water. How would you, Pierre? Uh, chicken. <laughs> chicken. Chicken and water. Okay. Which books are you reading right now? Um, fiction. I'm reading a book called Sanshiro by a Japanese author. And uh, nonfiction, um, The Obstacle is the Way, I think, by Ryan Holiday. Yeah. I'm finishing yep. my seven habits uh, of highly effective people. Classic. Nice. All right. Which superpower would you like to have? These days, maybe to fly would be would be nice. <laughs> be able to get around. I would prefer to convey the thinking of other people. Hmm. Mm. All right. <laughs> uh, what did you want to become when you were a kid? Um, for me, it was to become a famous uh, musician. And I think I'm still hoping, still working on it. I want, to, I wanted to become a doctor, but then no, I could not <laughs> make it. <laughs> All right. And the final question is: um, uh, When did you uh, encounter the term service design? Do you remember your first uh, sort of yeah encounter with the term? Yeah, um, for me, it was a few years ago. Um, I was living in Melbourne. I think I kind of discovered it through, uh, I initially heard about UX design, and I thought that sounded really cool. And then um, when I heard about service design, maybe just through the community in Melbourne, it sounded even cooler because it was, uh, you know, focusing on a wider uh, range of things. Um, yeah, I think that was maybe a few years ago in Melbourne for me. How about you, Pierre? In my case, I think uh, I started knowing this service design when I joined IDE six years ago. And that's when we talk about service designs. And then we, we also involve some in, in our projects. Hmm. All right. Uh, so that's, uh, that's good to get to know you a little bit better. We'll put all the links to the books in the, uh, the show notes. Now, let's dive into some of the work you do. and. Um, the first thing I'm really curious about is the IDE has been around uh, for quite a long time. Um, how would you describe its main purpose? Like, what is the goal? It's an NGO, uh, so the funding models are different, but uh, w where in the NGO space does it fit? Uh, I, can, I can start. So there's IDE, and then there's uh, maybe the Innovation Lab has a unique uh, um, perspective in some ways for that, because for us, our, uh, you know, our main goal and purpose really is to, to bring, you know, bring the user, user-centered design into the development sector, um, kind of create new ways of working and, um, in, you know, as a result, come up with more sustainable, more uh, inclusive solutions um, that are, yeah, more market-driven. But maybe IDE as, broadly has other purposes, which maybe Pirac can touch on. 
Yeah. So I think in addition to what Gonzalo said, um, because at IDE we believe that entrepreneurs are everywhere, including farmers. So that's why the way that we uh, work with them is not just give things free to them, um, but we use market-based approach and uh, human-centered designs to create more sustainable solutions. Because the purpose is not just to have like um, um, short-term solutions for, for, for the poor, but it's more like to design sustainable solutions for them uh, to create like a real change, real big change for, for their life. Hmm. So just to paint the context a little bit here for the people who are watching and listening, you're doing your work usually in rural areas of Cambodia with yep. uh, around uh, child nutrition, around farmers and around entrepreneurship. So yep. the context uh, feels quite different than um, maybe the, the more clean and, and structured and more organized uh, environment that most of the people like uh, who are in service design are in. But I still think there's so much we can learn about uh, your approach because usually resources are limited. There are many, again, many stakeholders involved. Um, yeah, so uh, let's dive into some of the... Um, uh, the challenges that you're encountering with doing these kind of uh, projects. When um, could you tell a little bit about when you start a project around uh, sanitation or hand washing? Like, what are some of the challenges that you encounter in the most uh, broad sense? Yeah, um, I can jump in, and then Pierre, feel free to add anything. Um, yeah. So. Broadly speaking, some of the challenges, you know, is, as we mentioned, this, the sector, um, you know, traditionally has maybe been working in a more um, traditional manner. And it's, it's uh, ID, the lab has really been pushing to kind of bring this, this new approach. So sometimes at the beginning of a project, um, at least when the lab was first, you know, founded, it was kind of a more of a challenge to bring this approach in. But um, now that, you know, we've been here for a while and, Organizations are kind of learning about these new methods and new ways. Um, we're, we're getting to try new things, but still, there are some, you know, things, restrictions, or things holding us back from, you know, potentially this more traditional model where donor money comes in uh, from another country uh, to focus on certain things. And you know, when when we go out into the field and uh, speak to the community, speak to you know uh, different users. Um, we learn that maybe the challenge is something else. And then that can sometimes get in the way um, of having a greater innova innovation or greater impact um, just because of how, you know, the sector is structured sometimes. Mm. Yeah. And, and I think in addition to that, it's also, um, as you know, that we work in the rural context, so no running water, no digitals. Um, so then, I mean, when we come to the, these designing solution phase we cannot really design like amazing thing for example like mobile app um, to solve the solutions but we need to make sure that our solution fits the context and can create more sustainable solutions mm. and at the same time uh, uh sorry uh, problems that we are solving are generally we get problems so it's not just from one angle like from one um uh, from one route that really caused this problem, but like many, many routes that really caused, caused this problem. So we need to tackle, we need to make sure that we tackle this problem holistically rather than yeah. just create yeah. one solution. Yeah, so in that sense, like uh, having uh, uh, to manage uh, stakeholders and get them comfortable with a different way of working, uh, you're st you're dealing with that, dealing with limited resources. You're you're dealing with that as well, and also with the, um, I would say, systemic approach towards uh, finding su sustainable solutions. Right. That's all. I think a lot of us can relate to That's to so these nice. challenges, and it's interesting to hear that even in such a different context, uh, uh, even uh, these challenges arise. Um, Maybe uh, it's fun to dive into some of the more practical examples of how you're doing your work and how you're approaching it and how you're trying to overcome uh, some of the challenges. So is there um, an iconic example, iconic story that comes to your mind uh, from the recent years that you've been 
uh, doing projects. Sure, yeah. And uh, Pierre, would you like to go first? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can, sure. I can start. So when you ask these questions, uh, the project that came, came in my mind is um, we call social behavior, behavior change projects. Um, um, my colleague and I, we worked a few years ago. And uh, the purpose, the goal of the project was to uh, reduce child stunting in Cambodia. And for your information, there was like 30 percent um, of children got stunted in Cambodia. So this project was try to reduce this, this stunting rate. So the, we decided to use human centered designs um, to tackle these problems. Um, and then we went to the field, we interviewed different stakeholders um, and also the users. And then we came up with some insights that we uh, brought to talk with our uh, clients. Uh, but, but the thing is that from the beginnings, they assumed that um, we should focus on zero to two years old children mm -hmm. because it's, it's like um, from their research or from that, from their, I don't know, like from something that they found out is that's the, the good age for us to focus on. But from our research, it was not. Uh, the age of children that we should focus on is from two to five years old because we discover completely different people took care take care of uh, children aged from zero to two years old very well but they lack of understandings to take care of the kids from two to five years old so that's why that's the challenge came we need to convince our stakeholders our clients like um, you know to shift their focus from their assumptions to what we really found from the field and two questions that come to my mind like uh how did you do this research how did you find this out and then uh did you manage to and if you did how did you manage to sort of uh convey your client that uh, they need to focus on a different group if they really want to tackle this challenge so let's start with the first question how did you find these uh this this insight it it actually it's uh, um it's came from different things that we need to manage to to gain this um in-depth insights so you know when we talk with them just use interview techniques normal interview techniques people say perfectly you know they told us like oh they wash their hands three times a day they took care of their kids very well you know that everything was seems to be very good but but then we we found out that, well, can we do something else than just talking to people like this? So we decided to do homestays. That's the time that we found out that no, they did not really do what they just told us. So, so, so for the people who are listening and have no clue, what is a homestay? You want, you want to share, Gonzalo? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it is what it, what it sounds like. Uh, it's it's going and staying in in a home in you know in a, in a rural village um and just kind of pretty much observing a family uh in their day-to-day -day life for you know a couple of days maybe one night um and just trying to understand yeah without necessarily speaking what what the behaviors are to see that the behavior knowledge gap or or the gap between what they're telling you and what they're actually doing yeah. And uh, one, yeah, one thing that also interests me is, uh, so you did the research, you did the interviews and you got the answers, but still you had a hunch that something wasn't, wasn't right. Like, what was that? Because you could have also accepted like, okay, this is what the interviews say, uh, say we need to move on. Mm. You, you know, like, um, this is when, when you talk with people, uh, from, at least from our experience, people tend to say something good about them. And, and sometimes we fall into this trap and we, we thought that, oh, okay, that's, that's right. Um, let's bring this to the office, analyze it and synthesize it and come with solutions. But from our experience, generally, we need to be smarter than that. I mean, we need to find better techniques to gain deeper insights. Um, in addition to what, you just, uh, what I just shared you, of our homestay, we also use another techniques that we showing the sketches, images, you know, photos, because 
because taking into account that we are talking to the poor uh, who live in the rural area, they, they are not, I don't want to say all of them, but generally they are not lit literate. So they need something that can stimulate their brain more when we talk to them so they can relate it. One, one example that I can tell is when we talk about the perceptions on poop, they could not, talk, they could not tell us anything from the beginning, but when we show them, the image of the poop, they started telling us, oh, this is watery poop. So this is, must be from the kids. And the other one must be from adult. And the one from the kids must be not so harmful. So, you know, like that, that's why it's very, very important to use all these kind of techniques to stimulate um, them and then they can share us more responses. Mm -hmm. And, um, what happened next? So you did, you did uh, more deeper user research, design research. You found an interesting insight that the problem wasn't uh, where you assumed it would have been. And now what? Like, uh, did you continue with finding, uh, trying to ideate a solution, or did you sort of present it to your client and hand it, uh, hand the research over? What, what was the next step? You want to try again? Uh, sure. <laughs> I was waiting for you. No worries. Um, so. It, the research stopped there to present to the client. Of course, it was it was a long term project, um, and so at that point we shared insights, um, which then kind of guided the uh, the actual design of the behavior change campaign. Because we it was kind of like over a multi year process, and uh, yeah, um, they agreed after yeah. some discussion, and it kind of drove the whole thing into a, a bit of a different direction. How how was their response? Uh, as in um were they surprised or did you get any pushback or because if they already knew that the problem uh, was between the ages of zero and two and you present something else like why did you still do the research how was that dynamic you know in these particular projects it's um it's lucky for us that the clients um he, they they really understand these kind of things and they, they believe in uh, design thinking in human centered design approach um so when we explain them, we um, I think from the beginning we convinced them already. But the thing is that uh, we need to, we need to convince other partners, other relevant stakeholders, including including governments. Um, so that's that's the difficult part because you know every stakeholder they have their own agenda and their needs. It's not it's not about right or wrong, but because they have their own things to be done to be accomplished. So that's why. Um, my team and I, we work on this project and we try, we, from time to time, we involve them in uh, progress update meetings. And at the same time, we went to the offices and then we had some discussion about that um, until at one point they agree, like what, what can they involve, you know, and what can be um, fixed together. So, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's not so easy, but um, mm. this is something that we have to, uh, we have to do. And something that... If, if you, yeah. yeah, go ahead, Gonzalo. Just, just jumping in, sorry. Yeah, something that always uh, tends to help as well um, uh, is actually taking the client uh, to, the, to the rural areas to conduct these interviews. Because even though potentially we're living in Cambodia, all living in Cambodia, you know, Phnom Penh life is very different to rural Cambodian life. So it's it's always useful to bring everyone along and just show them uh, our research and, and yeah, share that with them. Yeah. And, and that I guess is sort of universal. If you manage to get uh, mm -hmm. stakeholders involved in the process, rather than being an outsider waiting for the outcome, then uh, the entire dynamic of the uh, process is, is different. If you, if you think um, back uh, and look back on this project, what is, uh, what is the thing that you're most proud of? Yeah, I think I think the, uh, the insights that we discovered and also the shift that we made, you know, rather than just stick to the initial assumptions, we really shifted the focus. And at the same time, I think what we are proud of is we convinced the stakeholders to join the meet to join in the projects. And at the end of the projects, 
when it comes to uh, implementations, the partners, each partners can play a role by taking the solution that we created um, to use by their own. You know, so it, it becomes more like a holistic um, solutions that each one can take a part of the solutions. Yeah, it was almost like um, open source, like it, all the materials we designed uh, with with a, a design agency here are available on a website for any NGO or organization to download and basically implement themselves. So rather than only focusing on one organization that might only be able to fund the campaign for a couple of years, now it's, yeah, it's a bit more sustainable. Uh, and it's also helping to align the, the wa wash sector um, rather than sending out so many different messages to families in rural areas. Uh, this kind of helps to give one more unified message, which as we know is, is a much better way to change behavior. Hmm. In, in addition to that, I just want to emphasize that uh, the, the, the solution that we came up with, it's not so sexy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, as like in the corporate world that you create a kind of innovative solution like mobile app or something like this. So we created um, a washing, sorry, what do we call that? A hand washing buckets uh, that, that made of um, used paint bucket. And we created uh, a, a video that has these uh, modern grandmothers as an, ins as an inspiration, for example, of this kind of solutions. Um, but the thing is that these solutions can make bigger impact in, in the society, in the communities, because they can relate themselves to these uh, solutions. You know? hmm. Yeah, so that's, that's a beautiful thing about this. Like, well, we tend to get distracted by new technology, by shiny new objects, while finding solutions that are that are sort of regular and fit into the lives of the people already, whether it's your uh, customers, your patients, your students, maybe even your employees. Um, those uh, those kind of solutions usually usually are not disruptive. They are just plain ordinary, but they because they are ordinary they are easily accepted and used in actually used. So I think this is a, this is also a great a, example of don't overcomplicate it. Usually it's the, yeah. the simple things that make the biggest impact, right? And it's really hard to find those simple things. Absolutely. Yeah, that's true. I think people from the corporate world uh, may be frustrated when they come to work in the development sector like us, because maybe they expect solution should be more uh, radical innovations. But from our experience, we can say that generally the solutions that come out from uh, design thinking in the in the development sectors that we work is more about radical, sorry, um, incremental innovations. Yeah. So yeah. it's not it's not amazing things that you can uh, mm. see, but it really make uh, impact in the community. Exactly. And that's the only thing that counts, like how impactful is it, not how disruptive is it or how radical is it or how, how shiny is it. And I think that um, that makes our work also a bit harder because usually the solutions or often the solutions are quite obvious. Like in the end, you're 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 thinking, like, is this it? And and right. um you might get remarks from people like, yeah, but I could have come up with that. And the thing is, you didn't. Um, so for us, often it's really hard to, to explain that you need to go through this process and then the obvious things come out. The process is here to extract the obvious things and put them uh, to life. Yeah, this was so, really, uh, yeah, so, go ahead. Sorry. No, so, so much of the, the opposite uh, has, has happened as well historically where you know, it's um, organizations from with offices in you know, abroad are saying, yeah, we're going to design, I, I can design this, this is the great product, new technology, whatever. And then it gets uh, kind of dropped off in, in these communities and it, it just flops, you know, it doesn't work out. So it might seem simple, but it, sim like doing something simple is the hard part, you know, it's absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I think you had a second project that you also wanted to share, right? Sure. Uh, can you yeah. talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah, I wanted to share. It's a project before my time, but I feel like it's one that uh, it kind of captures the essence of of this kind of um, of how human centered design really brings value in the sector, um, and also how something we didn't mention earlier that uh, a lot of times when new solutions or new new programs are kind of put into place in uh, in the rural areas or in this sector, it actually adds to the complexity of the the system that we're we're working within um yeah so i'll try to i'll try to skim through this story but basically we had a agricultural um program that had recently you know put out a drip irrigation system um to help with farmers and at the time farmers were working in a more traditional uh farming style and weren't really using too many of these systems um, and initially, it was they were selling products, and over time, it kind of slowed down. And so they came to us to say, um, you know, something's wrong with our drip irrigation system. Like we we need you guys to redesign this. Um, and so cool, we uh, the team at the time went out into the field um, and spoke to farmers, and actually spoke to more people in the in the overall system, and. What they found was that the farmers really, uh, really loved this. I mean, they, they liked this uh, drip irrigation. They knew how to use it. They really felt that the organization was supporting them with the training really well. Um, and it, wasn't, it had nothing to do with the drip irrigation system. Um, and through talking to yeah, the rest of the, the people involved, we, we uncovered that actually uh, there was two main issues. One being that um, in some areas, other NGOs had been giving away similar uh, drip irrigation systems. And so the farmers would say, well, you know, why should I, why should I spend money if my name is getting for free? And also the neighbor wasn't necessarily using it because as we know, when, when things are given for free, they're not always valued. Um, and the other more interesting uh, reason was that the drip irrigation was working so well um, that the farmers didn't know who to sell the the extra produce to. You know, some of these farmers maybe they only have a bicycle or uh, to k- take the produce to the to the market, which can be far away. And so produce was going to waste. Um, so yeah, it wasn't the drip irrigation system at all. It was this link in the in the actual market. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Varek, anything uh, to else uh, to add to this? Sure. Oh yeah, Pierre. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think what Gonzalo said, the project was more, um, you know, like uh, people thought that it's it's this is a problem, but when when we use uh, design thinking or so human centered designs that we call in our lab, um, we found something else and we and we uh, fix it. And if I'm not wrong that social enterprise now they are progressing very well and they are on their they already changed their business model based on our recommendations and they are on their way to become like um uh to be like a shop like a in in the capital cities mm. so everything is progressing uh, positively with that mm. um, social enterprise yeah, and this is also, again, a, a really interesting example where you have a thing and when something is not working, your uh, initial reaction is to fix the mm. thing or look at the thing that's broken um, where uh, there might be something else in the context which is actually uh, causing the problem. And understanding that context is yeah, yeah. the way uh, to solve it. And how did you... How did you do research in this case? How how did you find uh, the insights? Basically, we we started by uh, doing alignment workshops. That's what we call. Um, so we involved uh, the stakeholder, especially our clients in the team, and to address all the concerns and everything. And a key is that we ex- we try to get them get one, at least one of them to be a part of the team. So what, so it, it's not just about like, oh, I enroll my clients and then I will give the, the, the progress update to them. It's not about that, but it's just like you, you will be a part of the, the team. 
And these many consultancy consulting companies are afraid of to do so, but from our experience, it worked well. So that's the first step. And the second step, like what you know, we, we, we go to the field, you know, we, in, we interview different um, people. It's not just our target, but like people that can influence our target, key person like uh, local authorities, also government, NGOs who's working there. So we, we talk to different stakeholders and then we come back and then we uh, analyze, synthesize, uh, following the design thinking process. So mm. this is how we how we work. Yeah, and it's really, again, about understanding the entire ecosystem, the entire context, the entire uh, system. And, and that's always the, uh, the um, I guess, the challenging part. How, uh, how broad do you need to go versus how narrow you need to go? Like how, how many people will you uh, interview? How, who is still relevant in this challenge? Now, the example that you're giving here, I can imagine that, um, no, let me ask the question here. What happened when you told the client that the problem wasn't with their product, but that it actually uh, was something outside of their existing scope? Uh, a client might say, well, what can I do about that? Like, that's not, that's not within my reach. What happened in this case? Yeah, um, I mean, the interesting thing as well, before I jump into that, is that this, kind of, this challenge, this new challenge kind of came up as a result of the drip irrigation system being put in place, right? So they wouldn't have uh, been able to predict this challenge very easily until the product was out there. Um, but I, I believe they, they, you know, embraced the idea and it was kind of like um, over a couple of years, they shifted, like Pirak was mentioning, they shifted their business model um, they are now working with, with contract farmers, uh, which means that, you know, they provide training inputs to the farmers and they purchase all of their produce. So the farmer's happy, they have inputs, they know they have a buyer with a fixed price. Um, and the, the organization itself can also make a commission of selling those vegetables to the, to the market. So it was kind of like a win-win for them um, in this situation. Yeah, so they shifted from being a product supplier to uh, facilitating, um, maybe I don't yeah. know how, to, how they phrase them right now, but maybe becoming um, a partner in building a more sustainable, healthy life for these farmers, something like that, right? That's Definitely. quite, a, that's quite yeah. a radical shift. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, think, I think now they offer like a holistic uh, solutions to the farmers. It, 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 it's not just like, oh, I, I sell the drip irrigation uh, devices to you, and then that's it. It's not about that anymore. So they offer trainings, and they also buy the produces from the farmers. So everything is, is complete now. Mm. Yeah. 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 I can, again, this sounds like something that uh, we might fight in a lot of service design projects the challenging thing is how do you actually get a client to act upon these insights um i don't know how big this client was or how agile or how small like did you experience um what what made it that they were able to actually go through this shift uh so i think yeah Pierre, you go go ahead <laughs> No, I mean, just ahead, because I think because they were a social enterprise, you know, which is in itself a, a different model to the traditional, you know, donor NGO model. It's, it was in their best interest to become uh, more like self-sustainable and, and actually earn a higher, you know, um, income or, or revenue uh, as an organization. Um, so maybe in this particular case, it was a, it was a good partnership um, with the organization. Uh, but with a yeah, with a more traditional, um, larger organization that might be reliant on yearly funding, yearly funding that uh, they kind of have to keep along that track to receive uh, the it. same funding yeah. next year. Yeah, might be tricky. So, so if I'm if I'm uh, uh, if I cut through the chase, they had a business incentive in actually making this work. Absolutely, yeah. That's yeah, yeah, exactly. and that's maybe different than uh, other stakeholders who are who have a different business or funding model. And in this mm -hmm. case, like seeing this as a business opportunity made them go after it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that that's correct. And you know, like 
you change or you die. <laughs> They, they, yep. can't, they can't say like, oh, I don't, I don't take your solution. I don't take your recommendations, but they have to face the consequence, you know. And that's also a good thing. Like uh, when uh, I was working with large corporates or with government, like the pain of not acting upon uh, insights, like, you know, they will still be around in five years. But if you're a smaller business and you're not uh, doing what your customers want, you, you become irrelevant and with a small business that happens really fast with a larger business it takes a while but eventually yeah when you're not relevant anymore to your customers it's it's game over yeah and it's, um, and it's yeah. a challenge as well you know the customers here it, uh, if they're going to invest in a, in a drip irrigation um, and it's potentially a low-income uh, family in a rural community like they really need to uh, want to buy this drip irrigation system. You know, it's like a, it's a big purchase, um, just as, for the example. So it's, the stakes are quite high that if, if you don't adapt, uh, it's, you're just going to lose yeah, a whole lot of your customers and quite quickly, uh, I would say, yeah. Do you see, like, what is the consequence of working on challenges that are so impactful on people's lives? Like, it has to do with health. It has to do with income. Uh, th these are these are super impactful things. Um, how does that influence your work? Well, if, if I understand your question, so I, I think it it really motivates me a lot. At least personally, I feel like um, I enjoy the work. You know, like um, every day I go to work, I feel like I contribute to this um, um, making people uh, life become better. And and at the same time, the, even though our solutions are not so amazing, but at the end of the day, it really help people. Um, to live better, you know, like having latrines. Um, I remember like one of the things that I work on um, is latrine projects. So before 2015, there was only, sorry, there was less than 60% latrine coverage rate in Cambodia. And I work on that projects as well. And, and now the projects improve progress and and it's cover sorry a lot of people they they have latrines you know they improve their life their health conditions improve so that's what i like um about working with in this sector and and sometimes as well you know when it's not something so direct like latrine um latrines uh, you know sometimes we do research that informs policies that might be rolled out you know in like in a few years time and um and so we do our best to bring the user user's voice or the community's voice into into these designs or into our recommendations um and it can be sometimes it can be out of our hands uh, how that's rolled out how that's implemented if if we are it's strictly policy um but and it can also be it can take some time to see any kind of impact you know not it, it, over time you know even in the two and a half years that i've been here situation changes and you know its impact is not always immediately uh, seen but it's the small wins i guess that that definitely uh make me want to come back to work yeah on, every day hmm. yeah it's different than uh working on the next mobile app right uh, i can imagine <laughs> the uh <laughs> The incentive is quite different. If you had to uh, share some of the key insights that you learned through this work and uh, give some pieces of advice for the people who are listening and watching this episode and who are probably working in quite a different context, um, what would you say? For people that potentially want to come and work uh in this sector no, well, well that would be also interesting uh, but also just for people who won't be working anywhere remotely like in this region and are working a large corporate or uh, a, a government agency in i don't know spain um, but also the other side like you said maybe people who want to come so uh, both both stories are interesting hmm. uh, well, i mean one point that i'll wanted to quickly talk on is at least from from this context you know a lot of the design 
thinking, uh, human-centered design methodologies or frameworks are developed for for that context, for the for Western or, or foreign context. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's it's kind of key to not be so um, protective of, of these frameworks and be able to adapt them to the context. Like, there are no, necessarily not many frameworks for this, this sector. Um, and so it's just really more about doing what, what needs to be done and really making uh, an effort. I guess this can be applied to corporate as well, but making an effort to reflect and check your your bias and your position, you know, within this context, um, whether as a, as a foreigner for myself or as a city uh, person going to rural areas, you know, kind of um, understanding that context and, and doing what you can to try to minimize the, the power relations um, and, yeah, any potential unconscious biases. I think it's, it's really critical. I mean, in any design role, I would say, but uh, it's, you particularly feel it, at least for me, in, in this context. Yeah, in, in addition to that, I think um, be prepared for the solutions that are not uh, considered as amazing solutions because don't, don't expect that in the um, development sectors because um, it's not always, um, you know, like the, the, the solution that we think is the best could be the best that make a real impact. It, it's not like that. So that's why I think people that come to work in the development sectors should expect that. How, and how do, you, how do you deal with that? How, how have you found a way not to, uh, or to communicate the value? I, like the simplicity of the uh, solutions, uh, it's about making the most impactful solutions, but do you still get uh requests from clients and and comments like these is, is this all you do or are you beyond that stage uh you know sometimes we we get the even requests for um, for apps for example for farmers and yeah it's actually the opposite where we have to say you know that would be an awesome project to work on but uh you know and we can try um, but we, we know that this, uh, from our experience, this might not work and this is a better route to go down. Um, and I think for ID specifically, oh, sorry. Yeah. Question. Uh, no, well, the, the, the thing that came to my mind is like, you have to be really clear about, uh, why you're doing something. If you're, mm. if you want to create impact on people's lives. Uh, it's something th that's different than uh, creating, doing a project for uh, from a marketing or branding perspective where you yeah. can say, look at this, we've designed this new shiny thing and um, being clear with your client what the real goal is. Do you want to create impact or do you want to okay. use this and that's a kind of exposure? Yeah. yeah, and that can be a challenge as well because obviously organizations want to have this shiny thing to, to show off uh, sometimes to, to donors and to secure more funding, you know, if that's the, the business model. Um, and so it, there is a push to that sometimes, but again, it comes back to, the, it's not about them, it's not about us, it's about the people that this product or service will eventually go to. Um, and yeah, it's, it's again, pushing the, a more sustainable solution, a solution that once the organization's funding potentially dries up, can still um, go on its own. I think that's critical um, because, yeah, historically so many programs end and that's it. And that, again, adds complexity to the next round of organizations that want to come in and do the same yeah. kind of work. Yeah. Yeah. So it, removing complexity is actually the, the goal, not adding to it. Yeah. 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 Anything uh, else you want to add to that, uh, Ferek? Uh, I, I just want to add that... Um... In the corporate world, I think when we work, we try to fulfill the needs and uh, maybe solve some pains uh, of the customers or users. But in the development sectors where we work, especially in the rural context, what we aim the most is to solve these big problems, finally. It's not just like, oh, I, I will need to fulfill the wants of the customer. For example, I will design a amazing lettering looks very nice it's not only about that but it, it we need to make sure that they will use it and 
at the end of the day, it will contribute to reducing the child stunting, you know, and um, improve their health conditions. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's maybe it's easier in these conditions to have your priorities straight. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's a that's the thing we can we can learn. Um, if people want to continue this conversation uh, with you guys, what's the best way to reach out? Yeah, um, the IDE Innovation Lab has an Instagram page, Facebook page. Uh, I'll, we can share the links. Um, and then, of course, email myself or Pirag if you want to share your email. Um, we're very happy to keep discussing, for sure. It's a small community, you know, and I, I find myself... Uh, sometimes talking to, to one person in, in another country doing similar kind of work. And there are so many, you know, you're like two degrees of separation often to a lot of, a lot of uh, people in this sector. I'm not sure all the relevant links are in the, uh, in the episode show notes. Okay. It was really awesome to get an insight in what you're doing in, uh, in Cambodia. Uh, uh, as far and as remote as it seems, I think there are many parallels between all the other sort of design projects around the world. Um, so that's that's quite interesting uh, to see. And I think uh, uh, we, and when I say we, we here in the West can, uh, can learn a lot from what you're doing here rather than uh, us trying to impose our ways of thinking and methodologies to... Uh, to how you should be using it. So uh, uh, awesome. Thanks again uh, for sharing your stories. What's your biggest takeaway from this episode? Leave a comment down below and who knows, your comment might just be the thing that inspires the next person. And if you enjoyed this episode, grab the link and share that with just one other person today. That helps me to invite more inspiring guests like Gonzalo and Virek here on the show for you. If you want to see more videos that help you to design services that win the hearts of people and business, click this video over here because we're going to continue over there. See you.